Let me go ahead and get this started. Welcome everybody. Uh, everybody is all hunkered down in their bunkers, wherever you are. Hopefully you're getting out and getting some sunshine and getting a little bit back to a more of a normal. Thank you for coming to our Dallas division uh, luncheon, if you will. Hopefully uh, at some point we'll get back to uh, Maggiano's and actually having luncheons in person. So this will work in the meantime. Uh, I'd like to start off uh, thanking the 2020 year long partners, Facets Appliances, Kitchen and Bath, uh, Chandler Cabinets, Fox Galbraith Lumber Company, Bank, Riddell Plumbing, Stellar Home Theater and Beyond. Uh, we're just about to start our webinar, but just a reminder, we will be taking for this program. Please put any questions you have in the Q&A and you can find that feature at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of the program. Also, this panel will be recorded and made available to Dallas Builders Association YouTube channel and Facebook. So that winds up our announcements. Let's uh, introduce our moderator, Britt Fair of Fair Texas Title. And the panelists are Paige Elliott of Dave Perry Miller, Rogers Healy of Rogers Healy and Associates, Alex Perry of Ali Beth Allman and Associates, and Kyle Ravinsky, Caldwell Banker. So Britt, will you please take us over? Absolutely, well, thanks, Matt. Um, well, we've got a great panel today, and so uh, let's, and it's also obviously been a uh, very interesting year so far. Uh, so let's get to the experts and uh, uh, find out uh, some answers to some questions. I guess the, the first question I would like to ask the panel is about the current inventory situation. We've been talking about inventory for off and on for years. And uh, then obviously some dramatic changes have happened with the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I would say, uh, Generally, what are you guys seeing as far as inventory availability? You know, here we are June 4th. Uh, what's it looking like across the, uh, the Dallas metro area? Well, I'll jump in. Hi, everyone. Um, we're seeing about, what I'm hearing is about a three month of supply. So where we had been more of a balanced market, we're kind of leaning towards a little bit of a seller's market. Uh, I'm here in six months is usually more of a balanced market and in most areas we're at about three months of supply so we're very under anybody else seeing anything different from that yeah I'll, I'll chime in I, I think there's been a lack of supply in the price points that you, I, I didn't expect I think the stuff over two and a half um, it, it was really slow and I, I think like all the rest of these guys we probably have seen spring and summer combined the past couple of weeks. Um, and I think that one thing that was really surprising to me is that the inventory over the luxury price point really for April was, I thought was really, really, uh, was really, really low. So um, yeah, I mean, that all price points, I think across DFW have been holding pretty steady. I thought April was bad, but the luxury price point from my experience, especially on this side of town, there was um, definitely lack of inventory. I think uh, just to uh, say what Roger just said is that basically what you have is a spring market in May right now. So there was no true spring market. And so what you're seeing is the spring market consolidated into May. I think it'll stretch into June. And I think July 4th is always an interesting time in Dallas because people get out of town. But this year that might not be the case. But I think you're seeing a spring market through May and June in that you're seeing a lack of inventory and a strong supply. Um, sorry, not a lot of supply and, and a strong demand. Uh, Britt, I had a new listing in Melshire Estates uh, in the $1.8 million range. Uh, when I went to go comp it, according to amenities, houses built after 2010 with a pool over 5,000 square feet on lots less than a half acre there were only 12 comparable listings in all of area 11. So it was a very muted market, I would expect. 
I guess I guess that's a, a little bit surprising to me on all those answers. I, uh, but that's very interesting. So I guess has that also the uh, the seller's market that you guys you know the tightening of inventory. Uh, have you also seen that in the uh, lot market and the teardown market? Any anything distinct about those? Uh, again, in the in the Dallas North Dallas area. I mean, I, I would just interrupt. I personally don't think it's a seller's market. I think it's a buyer's market. I'm always a firm believer that it's always a buyer's market because the buyers will dictate what they want to pay for a home. Um, I think what Rogers was saying and everyone else is that we are pleasantly surprised to see um, a lot of buyers out there making deals and not at low ball offers at market price. Um, I think it, you're seeing the same thing on lots. People aren't afraid to start building right now. Um, and you're seeing a lot of lots trade and even high luxury price lots trade. So across the board, you haven't, this is my opinion, you haven't seen a huge COVID impact on pricing and especially in the luxury we thought would be um, really hit. It hasn't been hit yet. Uh, and that's, I think there's a number of reasons we could go into that. But the answer to your question is no, you're seeing luxury lots and I think even lots in, you know, the sub million trade right now. The, the main affection of the lot market right now, Britt, I still think is more from the weather event back in October than it is from COVID. That, you know, created a perceived oversupply of those lots that, you know, are the 0.4 acre lots in the 75230 zip code. And I think both buyers and sellers are kind of sitting on their hands waiting to see who's motivated. And you I'll add. Word, I'm sorry. Wait, just real quick, Paige. Uh, so, Kyle, you said perceived oversupply. Does that mean you do not think there is an oversupply? I think I there's think a bunch of shadow inventory. It's a difficult question to answer because, you know, take it from the moderate to the ultra luxury. If you drive east, from Central Expressway, and then you look at the area in 75230 up and down Midbury, Yamini, down to Azalea, Lavendale, and then to Royal Lane, you still see a lot of damage on the ground. Then you head west and get into the Labello Estates area, and it looks nothing like it looked, uh, you know, six months ago. And I, I've seen some movement, but overall, I think uh, the lot values are still in question. Uh, before the tornado, the average 100 by 160 lot in 75230 transacted for a little bit over 650,000. And that's all of 75230. So you're comparing things from Harvest Hill all the way down to Walnut Hill. But uh, um, I think the number's a little bit lower this year. Okay, Paige, sorry, I didn't mean oh, to cut you off. No, no worries. So we, uh, two things, to address the lot sales, we had two lot sales go under contract or sale during the pandemic time period. So builders were still actively out there looking. One was actually a builder, one was actually an end user, and those happened over in Dallas. And then... To Kyle's point, you know, there's all of that going on post tornado, but a lot of those people are still settling. So there could be additional lots come up. That could be why sites are untouched. A lot of those people are still trying to settle with their insurance companies. So there's still a lot unknown as to what else is going to happen with all those properties. Okay, so I'll ask a follow up question since we're getting into uh, tornado talk and tornado aftermath and insurance. Uh, obviously, a builder audience today or many builders uh, any suggestions or, or tricks that you've figured out as far as uh, how to tap into that shadow inventory as it uh, page you just mentioned insurance settlements and whatnot I mean uh, obviously builders are constantly going to be looking for building opportunities uh, any tricks of the trade or suggestions that they might follow on on those tornado ravaged neighborhoods I mean, is there, if there's still opportunity, sure. But I, I mean, so much of this stuff got swiped up at the end of last year, right? And I think if you drive down Royal, um, a couple blocks east of 
um, of Hillcrest. I mean, there's already little mini developments getting planned. So I, I, I think personally that the opportunity to go in on the stuff that was damaged by the tornadoes, that opportunity probably has passed by unless it was somebody that was waiting it out. We've seen people that got damaged, waited it out to see what was going to happen. And probably what Paige was saying, they're waiting on their insurance settlement. And it just didn't make sense. So I would say probably 10% of the affected people, just a ballpark guess, there might be an opportunity. But I, I would think that that might not be um, a big thing to, to focus on. But one thing I wanted to say, too, to play off what Alex was saying, something I think we're going to see as well with new construction is I think the seasons are going to change. And I think that if people are swiping up inventory, historically, they want to be able to launch something in the spring or the summer. And if they're buying it in the spring and the summer, then that's going to just change when the delivery date's going to happen. So I think we're going to see some trends in the next three to five years, on the, especially the luxury price point, where we're going to see a lot of transactions in the fall and in the winter that historically that would have been the stuff that was on the market for, you know, three or 400 days. So, um, yeah. Well, and then, and then talking about the lots and picking up tornado lots, I think it's highly speculative still. We don't know what the market will put as a discount for what we will call quote unquote, a tornado block or street, right? Those houses haven't been finished yet. And when they are, there are a lot of builders who went in and bought them and bought them, I'd say relatively cheap um, to what they were pre uh, tornado. And look, no, no trees on a street, no trees on a lot. Um, we don't know the overall hit the market's going to dictate on those properties. We'll find out probably in the next six months uh, because some of the builders bought those lots. I think what you've seen is those were the ones that you could pick off for 600, 650, 700 were, were less risky than the ones you're talking about on Palomar, Ursula, uh, Kelsey, et cetera, where they were asking one nine. I personally think those, and I, I'm not, don't want to insult anyone. I think they're one three lots on a good day because you got to discount it now to the fact of almost a busy street, right? That's the way I look at it. And I think that sellers aren't realistic or have not been realistic about that big of a discount on those streets. And, and that's why you haven't seen as many sell on those streets, in my opinion, and or they're still arguing with the insurance company um, about total loss, et cetera. So that's my real point. quick, Brett, two things. Uh, I have MLS up behind the screen and for lots in 75230 right now uh, going over the last 90 days there are 37 active lots listing and according to MLS five have transacted so there's a lot of game to be played you know to test the market and that doesn't even include the ones that are sitting not listed yet in my personal business going to what Alex was saying we're still trying to determine how much value is tied to the beautiful canopied mature trees in these neighborhoods on these big lots. Uh, my business has had a great increase in people who live south of LBJ looking more to move to Bent Tree, Preston Trails area because of the large lots and the mature trees and you're still relatively convenient even though you're moving north of lbj well and if your numbers i'm assuming you know like i said your, your numbers are correct on the supply and obviously uh there's still maybe the disconnect that alex was talking about as far as uh, uh if, if there's that many lots that are available that means that there's a supply and demand you know the, the, the valuation disparity perhaps that uh people still trying to figure that out so um, okay, so we'll switch from tornado talk to, uh, back to COVID talk, uh, and I kind of I want to get a feel for how each of you guys uh, have adapted in the uh, the COVID world, uh, you know, to showing houses, looking for houses, uh, you know, what technologies are you using? How, you know, from a safety standpoint, uh, how have you changed your business in light of uh, this this COVID world, both? on the buyer side and on the seller side. Uh, Paige, you wanna start? Sure, so what we did right before we went into lockdown is we went to all of our properties, took videos, made sure those were available. And fortunately we had a lot of properties at that time that were vacant or unoccupied. So we were able to keep those open as 
agents were able to show, but we brought in a lot of video. We had floor plans done. Um, we, we got all of the uh, graphics online, really just trying to get every kind of collateral online. So as people are hunkered down at home, we're in lockdown, nobody's showing houses. If they're surfing the net, they can at least see everything and really get a feel for the property. That is fortunate, especially on the on the uh, unoccupied ones where you don't have as many issues with nervous sellers, you know, being nervous about people tracing through the house. Rogers? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can speak from the uh, broker perspective. Um, I, so we were one of the first offices to shut down and I'm, I'm just a worrier in general, but um, as far as the technology is concerned, I mean, obviously everyone is very um, appreciative of videographers and photographers now, probably more than they ever have been. And uh, the, you know, common term is dollhouse tour, but it's that Matterport tour. I think those people came out of the gate a few years ago, everybody loved them and then they forgot about them. But now um, I feel like most of us are using them again. So we've implemented that, but we've also just been a, a, another level stricter of approving tours and even having other realtors come in where last weekend we did our first open houses since the march 12th weekend and part of the requirement for our team is the people walking in the property everyone has to have a mask on right because i i look at it from a different perspective of liability and most of us don't have insurance coverage for COVID, and so i just don't want to be the person they, they trace it back to on either side of it so um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've relied heavily on Matterport and YouTube and all this kind of stuff, but all of us on this panel know that when push comes to shove, it's gonna be hard pressed to find someone who's gonna go buy something without actually touching it and seeing it and feeling it. So um, yeah, the, the out of town buyers are still there, but even they want an option period to, to pursue it. But yeah, we've just yielded to the side of caution. And a lot of times it's uh, frustrated my agents and our clients, but I just feel like there's a lot of unknowns still that um, I'm not going to be the guinea pig for it. So Rogers, let me piggyback just a, a follow up question. So when they're using those uh, technologies and, you know, seeing the house in a virtual sense, are, are you, I mean, are they typically then, you know, put it, maybe putting it under contract and then going to see it or how, how are they worked that in your experience? I think, okay, from a realtor perspective, it depends who we're representing. If you're representing a seller, we're going to probably encourage them, hey, you probably want them to go see the property before they go and tie it up under contract and, you know, add a stigma to it. But if it's a buyer, hey, that's why you got the option period. You can terminate because you don't like the smell of the grass, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I think it just depends on, on what side of the, uh, of the table you're on. But we are, we are seeing people submit offers without seeing the property. But if any of us have been the listing agent or even an owner on that, you just, you can't really sleep at night knowing that they haven't seen it. And then they pop up like, you didn't tell me it was on a busy corner and that camera you used was wide angle camera. It's like, yeah, cause I'm, I'm a listing agent, you know? So yeah, we, yes and no, but I think that it's still going to come down to people actually touring the property. And I think the month of April for us, last thing I'll say was the month of fear like just to where there's so much we didn't know where I think a lot of people didn't want to get out if they didn't have to. Right. But then it led to us having an influx of business in May and June, because when they can't get out and do anything, they're on their freaking cell phones and all of a sudden they're on either a dating app or a real estate site. And next thing you know, they want to sell their house. And move. Alex, how about you? Anything um, technology wise that you have done differently on the, uh, whether with buyers or sellers? No, I mean, I kind of actually went the opposite way. Um, I obviously love like contact, direct contact is something I, I embrace and love. And I think Rogers kind of hit on it. A lot of the technology, technology you're talking about, it existed prior to COVID, right? It wasn't like all of a sudden this was this new technology. It aided in what we did. But I, I kind of lean to all the FaceTime calls and all that stuff. It's not great for our business because the two two contracts I lost were because they were FaceTime buyers who wanted to see it in person. I've always said you need to see a house in person, feel it, know it to really buy it. So really what I concentrated in that time frame was picking up the phone. And most people wanted to know, hey, what's going on in the market, right? What's really happening? What's going on the ground? And I also kind of took that on to I called lenders, I called insurance companies, I called commercial real estate, I called people where I wanted to be educated as well. So I said, if I want this, my guess is people want it too from their residential agent. And so I proactively just started calling clients, telling them what I was seeing. And the truth is I've been shocked about how quickly the market kind of turned, like no one was really doing anything in March and sitting around. And I, I do think that having, 
you know, tours of homes they can see it so that when this lifted, they could decide quickly what they wanted to see. But technology makes our job easier. I love the fact that my clients, my buyers want to see two or three homes and not 20. Because 10 years ago, technology didn't allow the buyer to do a lot of the research they already can do and see. So it just narrows the list and then it makes, you know, buyers more knowledgeable when you go to show. And, and sometimes it makes sellers more knowledgeable as well in what they should be getting on for their property. So I, again, went back to the basics. Yeah. Kyle, uh, Britt, my luxury listing have been frustrating in uh, late March, all of April, early May. I would get a showing request on one of the houses. I'd call the house to say, hey, let me bring this prospect by. And the seller would say, I'm in my home office. My husband is in his home office. My three kids are homeschooling. We've got nowhere to go. We can't leave to let the house be shown. So convert relationships with builders and new construction homes have been a dream because those houses are vacant, uh, they're clean, I can go in with my clean protocol, I have masks and gloves for all of my clients if they need them, and it turns into, I can see this house in pictures, or I can see this house in person, and it gives a great advantage to the builder. Yeah, it seems like they've had an advantage now, whether that's dissipating over the, uh, as, as Alex said, it seems like the, uh, the, the panic in the market seems to have, have gone mm -hmm. away somewhat. So maybe that advantage is, is going away, but certainly, uh, you know, to whatever degree there is panic, uh, going into a vacant house is much more, uh, uh, ease of, uh, peace of mind than, you know, for all the parties than going into one where it's currently being lived in. So, mm -hmm. um, Let's talk about virtual closings for a moment. Um, I'm in the title business and obviously in the closing world. How uh, how virtual uh, have the closings been during this period? And have you have you noticed changes uh, in your closings from you know the first of April to now the first of June? Uh, Alex, I guess I haven't started with you yet, so I'll start with you this time. Well, I mean, I would say you know agents at closing are really only there for you know moral support, anyways. Uh, usually, right, we've looked over the docs, seen the HUD, et cetera, um, all the important stuff before then. So to me, it hasn't been a change, you know, a big change. A lot of the title companies have relaxed a little bit on, on um, notary, notarized items, et cetera. So to me, it's been fine. Um, I, I will go back that if you're, it, it's, again, everyone's getting more comfortable, but up until about a week or two ago, you know, I told my clients, you know, you better be excited to go to closing, not nervous to go to closing. Because if you're nervous, we're not going to end up at closing. So that was kind of the coaching I did from the get-go. And so I had more success with that where people weren't nervous. They're excited to buy their home. They weren't getting freaked out. And I think the stock market obviously has a lot to do with that. When you have huge volatility, that's going to scare anybody. So I just think there's an overall calming effect that's going on right now. And with that, you know, Title companies do a great job of communicating, hey, this is what we're going to do. This is what it's going to look like. We're going to come out to your car or we'll come meet you. And, you know, everything, communication is key, right? And so as long as you're communicating with your clients and there's no surprises, for the most part, that's probably been the easiest thing. Um, Paige, how about you? What what have you seen on virtual closings? What any Anything different or unexpected or the evolution over the last couple months? No, I think to follow up with what they said, the clients um, feel very comfortable. We've reviewed all the documents ahead of time. The title companies typically have sent them the documents to review. Um, if it's been a cash close, they really only need to sign two documents. Everything else they've been able to do by DocuSign. And so for all parties, when they go, literally it's like a drive up, hey, I'm here. The closer comes out, they've got a single use pen. Everybody's in gloves and masks. They go back in, you know, whatever they need to do and come back. And it's been um, successful, very successful. And I think a lot of people are looking forward to some of these practices going forward, not the complete leave the closing table, but some of this ease in transaction. Um, the mobile notary has been huge for a lot of people, although nobody's really going anywhere. Sometimes people are elders. Some really good things that have come out of the pandemic in terms of how all of this has been handled. Yeah. 
Kyle, anything you've seen that uh, remarkable um, changes in the last couple months? I've just been impressed with the way that the title companies kind of led the wave in protecting the clients showing up for closings. It was, uh, you know, evolving almost at an hourly pace. I had a, a luxury closing right at the end of March and I was representing the listing and the seller was very skittish about what the buyer was thinking and the market was changing. You know, the market was plummeting at, at the time and he was worried his closing wasn't going to happen. The title company was very soothing and very proactive to comfort everybody involved, but also not to the level where they were going to panic everybody involved. And uh, other than that, I haven't had uh, an issue with the title company related to health concerns. Mm -hmm. Good. And, and Rogers, uh, you had back to you have two different perspectives, both as a realtor and as a broker. So uh, maybe. Do you have anything to, to comment or to add on that from either of those two perspectives? Yeah, no joke. I haven't touched another human since March 11th. Um, and I'm not kidding. I got engaged on March 21st and we've been in like pre-marriage boot camp ever since. <laughs> so um, we, we, I, I've avoided people at all costs and now I finally have an excuse to do it. And so I'm, I'm just kidding. Now, it, it's easy. I think the easiest way to describe it is it's, it's Sonic drive-in and, and real estate had a baby, except we don't get tater tots or one of those really fun drinks. So it, they, they've made it easy. I think everybody, and I think another group to really give a lot of credit to is Metro Techs. I think that they stepped up and really put um, the health concerns of the community ahead of anything else. So yeah, it's the new normal. And, and I think to play off it as well, I've learned I can work from home. I, I, I actually love it, and um, I, I have office leases that I have to pay for. But, yeah, that's, that's going to be, I think, the next big hurdle for um, real estate people is figuring out what does it look like when there is a vaccine and it's 100% safe. But, yeah, mobile closings have been great, and I do think that um, another reason people go to closings on the realtor side, which is a whole other conversation, I'll never understand it, but giving someone a closing gift. Right. I, I never understand a realtor that shows up to the title company with a big old fruit basket to take a picture with them when you're literally paying them for the job that you did well. Right. Um, so I, maybe that's another panel. Uh, we can do it after hours with some cocktails. <laughs> but, um, Count me in on that one. Yeah. But I, I have seen a lot of people post pictures of their clients. I'll tell you this from a social media perspective without them in it. And I can appreciate that. So. Um, yeah, we read the closing disclosures. We make sure our commission is right. We make sure the numbers make sense. Maybe we don't need to go to closings moving forward. So, Britt, you need a smaller office because the lobby for the realtor ego is a thing of the past. <laughs> I'm glad this is being recorded. I can I can tape that and yeah, put that. That's uh, lost my business. It's great. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the challenges that we have certainly seen over the last couple months has been in the jumbo lending market. Um, sort of that mid March, there was a, a freeze up in the mortgage markets. And um, it's particularly acute in the in the jumbo world. So, uh, Kyle, I'll start with you. Uh, have you have you faced trouble with that? And has that evolved since mid March? Is it still a problem or you, that you're seeing? I haven't faced any trouble with any of my preferred and known local lenders. If as long as you maintain control over it, uh, things have pretty much been status quo. Where I have had problems is buyers who are at a more moderate level thinking that they can beat the market by going to Quicken Loans. And Quicken Loans seemed like they were changing their qualifying guidelines on an hourly basis. Well, we need more of this. Well, you have to, you're carrying too much debt or we need to see this document sign and they were just constantly constantly changing their game in one um, instance in particular i had a client that was working with quicken loans and we were like 35 days into it and couldn't get a clear to close from quicken i switched him to a local lender they got everything in place and qualified and closed in 10 days Wow. Anybody else having uh, difficulties or challenges or seeing an impact on the 
the high end of the market because of the jumbo uh, situation? You know, right after we went into lockdown, we spent about a week and a half keeping together what we had in process. There were loans that had to be reworked, and these were qualified, established buyers who were well in the progress. But if they had a secondary, uh, a second loan on a secondary market, those percentages were switching. Those lenders were saying, we're not doing 80% loans. So a lot of things were happening on that secondary market that were affecting our well-qualified buyers. So the first week and a half, you know, thank God we were able to keep it all together, but there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of stress early on. Now, it seems to have all leveled out. Everybody we have currently working with lenders are all, you know, not having any issues. And there's, the rates are great. This is a great time to buy. And buyers are taking advantage of that. And fortunately, you know, the mortgage situation, it appears to have been leveled out. And this is kind of across all different price points. Rogers or Alex, anything you've seen different on the mortgage world that has impacted your clients or, or uh, whether buyers or sellers? Only thing I'll add, I think people are gravitating more towards boutique banks. And it's a kind of playoff. I mean, Quicken obviously is an extreme example of, of, a, of a big boy, but I think people really, I, I had a miserable experience with a PPP loan. Right. And I used to be with a very large bank and it was it was literally miserable and it drove me to working with a, a boutique locally owned bank. I think people are going to have the same experience when they're trying to get approved for a loan, whether the um, qualifications or the yeah, the qualifications are changing or not. At the end of the day, it's, it's just not a fun process, even if you're saving a quarter of a point. So I do think we're going to see the rise of small banks, you know, legitimately fighting against, you know, the the. 800 pound gorillas in the fight. And I do think that the stock market is also going to be a big part of it. You know, obviously people, it, it still is a roller coaster. Another 2 million people file unemployment last week and the stock market still goes up. What? That makes no sense to me. So I, I think people that have their hand, their body in the cookie jar, eventually they're going to get, they're going to get roasted, uh, which is going to make our industry that much more, um, you know, appealing to them. But yeah, I think that there's some factors that are going to come up, but um, yeah, interest rates are still low and all, all price points. And, you know, that's why we really haven't seen a big slowdown. So Alex, have you seen any, had any challenges in the jumbo world? No, I mean, Kyle put it well, right? We have a, we have some control when it comes to who our client chooses lenders, or if we represent the seller, you know, before we, we agree to a contract, we ask the question who the lender is, you know, um, you know, closing deals is how agents get paid. So it's our job to understand who the lender is and whether they're going to be able to see this through. And I think so many times, if you've been in the business, you know who can get it done and who can't. You know, if the if a lender says, we'll get it done, they'll get it done. I agree with Rogers. I think the small banks um, perform in a lot, uh, way more efficient um, manner than the big banks. The big banks tend to promise you the world and then start changing things get closer because they have you in bed basically um that being said some of the big banks do come through uh for even on the luxury side there's private wealth uh with the big banks and they make it happen but at the end of the day you go with the, the relationships you relationships you have that say they're gonna get the deal done and that's one less thing you hope to worry about going towards closing same thing with title that's why we use the best title companies like your title company and other title companies we want to concentrate what we do best let the other people do what they do best Great, thank you. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Talk about schools just briefly. Um, obviously, schools are always a a hot button when it comes to real estate and purchases. And um, the the COVID nineteen experience for schools has probably been frustrating for every parent out there. And so I would ask, you know, and I, I'm, I'll just tell my experience briefly that I have three different kids in three different schools and all three different uh, uh, places did things very differently and some, some well and some not as well. Um, what are you all seeing, uh, Paige, I'll start with you, but what are y'all seeing uh, from a buyer preference perspective uh, when it comes to they are, are they concerned about you know buying in this neighborhood or buying and thinking about that private school or this public school um, from a 
COVID-19, remote instruction, those types of things. What's What's been on the minds of buyers? I know it's only probably a temporary phenomenon, we hope, but it certainly appears to still be a real one going into this fall. So Paige, I'll start with you. Okay, so, and I still have kids in the school district, so it does, uh, I do have a little bit of pulse on this, but I have not had buyers really wanting, I'm making a move because of how this all played out during COVID. That's not to say that that won't happen. It may be, here's what happened this spring. Most of the schools are doing surveys back to their parents on did this work, didn't this work? And I know there's mixed camps on how that happened in a lot of neighborhoods. Were the private schools doing it better than the public schools? Are we gonna do partially online, et cetera, et cetera? I think the buyers, if they're gonna make a change, are gonna see how that rolls out this fall. So probably when we get more instruction as maybe come August, you know, here's how fall's gonna look. We're going back to campus. We're not going back to campus. You're gonna have one, you know, more instruction, less instruction, et cetera. I think that might be a decision that may still be yet to be had because I think this is all just so new. There's definitely been frustration and such and such, but I haven't seen anybody making that move. And maybe that's just where I am. But I also think too, they don't really know how that's gonna, if it's gonna change. If, you know, what they did this semester is the same thing, or if, there's, if they're anticipating something else. So I think that that could be something that could impact down the road. And it may also be an issue for relocation buyers. So we can add that to the question too for, um, Rogers, you have any, uh, school impacts as far as uh, the COVID-19 and how that's impacting the transactions that you're contemplating? I think school districts are going to trump everything else. I think they always have. And I think whether they're moving to Plano, Highland Park, South Lake, Colleyville, whatever. Um, I, I think that personally, we haven't seen a big migration out. I think that um, there's going to be some interesting situations with high rises and with apartments and even with shared walls. But it's, I mean, I literally moved here from South Texas with my family to go to Highland Park High School. And there was no logic literally other than that. Um, and so I, I just kind of stand with, I don't have children, I don't think. And I, um, I, I know that people move to the Park Cities for the school district. And they move to Capel for the school district. They move to Plano for the school. It, that's not going to change. I think we are going to see people move to neighborhoods that they wouldn't have thought about in the past that maybe they get a little bit more land. Right. And so a million dollars south of 635 in a good school district versus north of 635 in a good school district, that's that's two different animals. And I think people want to be able to go in the backyard and throw a football, but they also want to go to the backyard and get away from their um, their family for a minute. And Kyle, uh -huh. mentioned a, a, a husband and a wife having their own office. That's not a normal situation. Right. Like I'm in my dining room right now. Like This is my office. And, um, you know, with three dogs and a. And a and a lady, but yeah, I think there's gonna be people like looking at different neighborhoods that they wouldn't have considered in the past, because again, back to a trend, people are gonna be working from home a lot. And, and the commute problem back in the day, I mean, in, in Dallas driving 15 minutes is a pain in the butt, right? Go to Houston, go to Atlanta, go to Chicago, go to LA, 15 minutes is, is, one, is in between stoplights. So I, I think there's gonna be shifts of what's con considered convenient and you know, land, land and schools are, are gonna be a big driving factor. Oh, that great point. So I'm going to come back actually uh, a little bit later to to commutes and land use, but I want to I just want to touch on. So Kyle, I know uh, uh, you, you actually uh, you're a, a Green Hill alum and you sell a lot in the uh, Preston Hollow area, and you know probably have people contemplating private school this and you know or versus moving to Plano or moving to Park Cities or South Lake or whatever. Uh, what have you seen? Anything different from this COVID education program uh, in your markets? Kyle? Sorry about that. I was muted. I know everybody wants me muted all the time. Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, buyer's prospects that I'm coming into contact with aren't so much worried about the schools if they're not using them. I try to educate them that every property is great as long as you're priced according to what the amenities are. Um, a big break point in far North Dallas, 75248, you all may be familiar, Brentfield Elementary is the most sought after public elementary school. 
in Dallas, City of Dallas Richardson Schools. It's very close in proximity to Bowie Elementary and to Prestonwood Elementary, um, but their schools aren't valued the same and sometimes properties will list at the same price parameter as Brentfield and you just have to explain to somebody if this house is worth it for you the way that it fits, that's great, but understand they're pricing it the same as the most valuable elementary school and it would be like, you know, pricing Armstrong Elementary to, to Pershing. You know, I mean, beautiful houses, great neighborhoods, but anybody, you know, it, it's not hard to say which one is the more valuable uh, amenity. Um, so I, I work around it a lot. Uh, people ask what are, you know, we, what are the best educational facilities? I'm not allowed to hazard my opinion as much as give them the information and school ratings and let them make their own decisions. Alex, I want your opinion, but I'm also going to specifically add another question to it. And that is, uh, have you seen this COVID-19 thing equalize out some of those school, you know, I mean, uh, some of the highly reputed or you know, highly reputable districts or private schools, uh, is, is that in the luxury markets that you're serving, uh, still as big a factor today, you know, knowing that the fall may be online instruction again. And is that, is that factor still as high in the post COVID or, or in, in while we're in COVID world, uh, are you seeing the same thing, Alex? I mean, I think what, what happened is when the stock market was getting crushed, what you had people doing was putting an onus on public school again, on the park cities where they're saying, well, you know, I was thinking about sending my kid to private school. Well, maybe I won't do that. So let me go either look in the park cities or stay in the park cities. Um, so it was certainly having an effect, but I think that was more COVID stock market driven than COVID safety driven, in my opinion. Um, I think as a whole, people still want to be in the areas they want to be in. They love certain schools. They love certain districts, some certain neighborhoods. Um, I can, you know, change the question up a little bit to talk about SMU. Um, I do a lot of investment real estate as well. I think it's interesting at first, you know, everyone was a little nervous and will SMU students be paying their rent? And what does that look like? And, you know, they didn't miss a beat. The funny thing is SMU students went home for a month and then couldn't wait to be back in Dallas away from their parents. You know, I had, I had students say, can I move in early? Um, and one of my leases, the, the people went, you know, wanted out and wanted out right away. And I said, all right, I'll put a sign in the yard. And as soon as I can rent it, you can get out. It didn't last two hours, you know, at the same price. So I think, and I'm kind of going a little away from your question, but not trying not to answer over what everyone else did is, I think rental, the rental market is extremely strong right now. Uh, because people don't know where they're going. I think schools will always be important, as Roger said, huge drivers, huge drivers. I think people are moving to Dallas a lot of times because of schools. And, you know, quite frankly, <laughs> this market is fun. It's exciting. Things are happening. And for a month, there wasn't a whole lot going on. And now it's the opposite. I mean, I, I haven't worked. I mean, I'm always working hard, but I haven't worked as hard as I've done now in my whole career. So uh, it's fun. I embrace it. And uh, anytime you get an advantage, as Kyle gets by knowing every school like the back of his hand, Rogers, everyone on this this panel is is good at what they do. It's because they just have the knowledge of every little detail that goes with that. Mm -hmm. Which begs okay. the question, how important is school really? I'm a graduate of Champion School of Real Estate, which is way more important than my SMU degree. So I think we just go and we lead kids to real estate school as early on as possible. <laughs> Hey, I think I think uh, Rogers just camps outside of champions and just yeah. you know picks off the ones he thinks the best. They love free pizza. It's amazing. <laughs> it's funny. The the only person on the panel who wants more realtors is the uh, is the broker on the panel. So uh, eh, uh, I don't know. Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, so um, okay, so I'm gonna go back to Rogers because you brought up something I think important, and that is also in this post COVID world, or or certainly post. Uh, when it, when it hit our shores, uh, we've changed a lot. You, you mentioned about uh, office usage and, and people working from home. So I'm going to sort of take you up on that uh, and, and start you with this question. And that is, what features have become more popular? You know, I mean, obviously, 
having a strong home Wi-Fi signal and you yeah. know our, our home offices. Uh, you know, are, are, is it important to have two home offices in a in a luxury home? What, what kind of features yeah. are you seeing? Uh, over the last couple of months that have sort of regained prominence or, or gained prominence for the first time? So I'll, I'll lead by saying what Alex said earlier was really smart about how he called his friends in commercial real estate. I think following the trends of real estate in general are really important. And there's a really good page called The Real Deal. It's an Instagram account, which is based out of Manhattan. But right when this happened, everybody with money in Manhattan fled to the Hamptons, right? Or they went to Florida. And I think that then the next thing is today, they, there was a big class action lawsuit that WeWork is suing uh, over the failed or they're getting sued over the failed IPO, which that means it's trending towards the open office space probably getting killed, which is probably going to lead to residential real estate where people that like the open floor plan, the living room, the kitchen, the dining room, all within one view, it might shift back more towards, you know, a, a, a divided up property. So I think we're going to see stuff like that as well. But um, I also don't fully remember your question because I think I was about five seconds ahead. So I'm going to pass oh. the mic or I'm going to, try to save myself here. So what was the question again? You can, or you can jump back in also. Yeah. The question is like amenities, you know, home offices. Um, oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I, I think home offices and I, I think the stuff that we saw fade away, whether it's a media room or um, a formal dining room, I think people are actually going to want that because like, like with what, what I was saying, I'm literally working out of my dining room, which means the thought of eating here makes me feel disgusted because it's going to remind me of work. So yeah, high, high, high speed internet, you know, a big backyard and enough room to where you feel safe, but you also have a neighborhood feel. Those are never going to change. But I do think there's going to be a shift more towards the old traditional layout of a property with designated. Paige? So Paige, what we're seeing, have... yeah. So what we're seeing uh, across all price points is that these buyers do want either a designated study or a bedroom that can be used as a study. Kind of to Roger's point, they need some place that they can step away, make a phone call, do some work, whether all the time or in another, you know, God forbid, wave of pandemic. So they do want that space coming in. Um, I'm still hearing they still kind of like that open space, but as long as they have somewhere to step away to study, then they're then that's then that's definitely going to come up on the list. We're still seeing they want exterior amenities be it a yard, larger yard, a patio, some kind of outdoor space, um, somewhere that they can either, you know, also get away from each other or just have somewhere to go. You know, you saw all these memes where everybody was joking around, oh, today I'm going to the living room, you know, but that was that outdoor space has become really important and has probably, you know, moved up on the list after that uh, designated space to kind of get away and actually do some work. Uh, Alex, what have you seen? Any any uh, amenities in, in, in your uh, experience over the last couple of months that have become more important or which ones have become less important? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that as you sit in your house and realize what you don't have because you're stuck in there, you realize, you know, exactly what you want in a home. I think that drove the market right to begin with. I think there's other factors that are driving it now, but the start of it was people sitting in their house saying, all right, what would I really like? And do I have the means to go change this? And if they do, whether it was high rise living to single family, apartment to townhome or single family, et cetera. And I think, I think the media room was dying. I think it was being eliminated by a lot of homes. I think you'll see that come back in the right spot. I think that um, personal gyms, although it wasn't dying, you'll see more dedicated spots for gyms. Um, I think, as Roger said, two offices will be very important. You're already starting to see that. You know, a lot of times if you're a builder, you get away with it with a flex room and it can become anything you want. I think that's important because you never know if someone wants two offices, two living rooms, two gyms, whatever it may be, right? But that flex room will just be important um, and maybe stubbing it out for plumbing or electrical that you can switch pretty easily for what someone wants. So, uh, yes, you absolutely have to be cognizant that we are now in a post-COVID era. Is that 100% different than before? No, but there are some rooms and things people want. One thing we're doing uh, when we're talking to builders right now is called an Amazon room so that when you drop off packages, they can be secured and also temperatured, which people don't think. But talk about medi dropping off medicine, things like that. So little things like that you wouldn't think of, but are certainly post-COVID era. Uh, are important, less human to human contact, right? Right now, maybe that changes in a year um, when, um, you know, when they come up with a vaccine, but right now it's, it's certainly on the forefront of everyone's minds. And 
Um, I say that kind of in a parting way because I apologize, but I've got to run to uh, a one o'clock final inspection. But I appreciate everyone's time. And um, I think the panel was awesome. Everyone has great different points of view. And Britt, thank you for, uh, for all you do for everyone. Your, your market updates, honestly, are so real and true. I appreciate it. Honestly, they're, they're, they're great <laughs> for the community and all of us. Well, thanks, man. And I, I won't call on you again since like, you got to go, but I appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Thanks, Alex. Good to see you, Alex. Um, Kyle, what, what are you seeing from an amenity standpoint uh, uh, in this post-COVID world that we're in? It's like I'm working with Ro – oh, am I on? Yeah, it's yeah. like I'm working with Rogers. I have a client right now that says spouse one needs an office. Spouse two needs an office. The kids need a classroom, a Zoom classroom. Then we need a fourth area that doesn't remind us of our work school area because we're so frustrated in our work school area that we need a relax room. So, you know, it was funny. Ten years ago, I remember saying two living areas doesn't cut it anymore. Now I'm saying three living areas doesn't cut it anymore. You need to have two offices, a classroom, and then a playroom, game room that is like an escape from the other spaces. And if we're playing under a scenario where this, you know, you hear it crammed down our throat dozens of times a day, this is the new normal, which I don't think it's the new normal, but if people want a level of comfort and confidence in their move up house, the main consideration is a four living area house in the, at the luxury level. Okay, and so Kyle, I have a follow up question for you since I know you sell a lot in North Dallas uh, and that you, you mentioned tornado earlier. Have you heard any? We don't talk say tornado, about, we say weather event. Sorry, weather event. <laughs> but uh, have you heard any requests for? Um, shelter, you know, whatever, whatever that looks like, safe rooms or, you know, has, has that already passed since that was in October? You know, it, it, not specifically. I remember there was a big move in 2005 to 2007. You would, uh, a builder would tout that they had a, uh, what was it, a Kevlar lined safe room. You know, usually it was an under the staircase kind of closet conversion where they would put Kevlar along the walls and they would call that the, the tornado room or the safe room. Um, I haven't had any clients ask for that specifically. I think that could easily be a retrofitted item at the buyer's request. I don't necessarily know. You know, people love to ask me, Kyle, I have $15,000 to throw at my house. What's going to be uh, the main thing I do that's going to get me a higher sale price. I don't think Kevlar safe room is that item. Um, it's definitely just a personal taste related to uh, a family's peace of mind. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to ask one last question and then we're going to get to uh, the Q and a, but uh, every year, one of the questions that we ask this uh, at this event is about green building because you know it, it's been a trend of some to some degree uh, when uh, over the last couple of decades really as far as people thinking green and um, so I guess my question to each of the panelists is um, do people uh, buyers out there uh, where does green building rank on their list of priorities and then the follow-up question is do they put their money where their mouth is as far as are they willing to pay uh, additional dollars to have a green house. So, um, Kyle, I'll start with you on this question. Uh, it's a tough question. Uh, new construction, it factors in to the cost of the product. And, you know, in Area 11, non Highland Park, you know, you're seeing houses on traditional sized 100 by 160 lots where they're stacking the square footage at 7,000 square feet. And, you know, the, they're getting $350 to $450 a square foot. If the amenities are listed and you happen to have Energy Star rated appliances um, and other uh, efficiencies, it does catch a buyer's eye. Um, 
I haven't had anybody ask for a new construction with like geothermal or anything. I mean, that's way on the outside of the bell curve. But I do think, you know, it's like saying, are people concerned about smokers? You know, whatever, 1975, you weren't that concerned about somebody who was smoking. Now, it's a huge issue. So I do think people look for it. They don't necessarily know what to ask for, but they like seeing that a property has efficiencies. They like the foam insulation, um, and they like knowing that their utility bills are going to be muted. Okay. Rogers, I'll ask you the same question with a, a slight tweak, and that is from a builder audience, uh, what are the green features that you're seeing that your clients want, your buyer clients want, and are willing to pay for, willing to spend a little extra on? Um, maybe I'll answer a little bit differently. I don't think a green feature is going to make or break a deal. All right. And I'm all about the environment and for uh, loving and saving Mother Earth. But at the end of the day, it's going to come down to price and the product and the location. So it, uh, people appreciate it. But again, like a lot of us are getting, I don't know if it's as extreme as the cigarette uh, analogy, but I think a lot of us are getting educated along the way, right? And I think back in the day, the first big thing we saw were the solar panels, right? And then at the same time, ironically, the Segway came out. It's going to change the world. And then where's the Segway, uh, you know? So being environmentally, being environmentally friendly is not necessarily trendy, but I still think it's not going to go and be the deciding factor really a, a across the board. And, and the big certification that came out, the a, a certified green home specialist for realtors, my guess is that probably didn't help them close any more deals. It just educated them, right? So if you can do it, then great, but buyers tend to gravitate towards the same thing on the description after they see the pictures. And when they're seeing the house, they're probably gonna forget about the fact that that one that they love doesn't have whatever you know the, the, the trending thing is for that year. Paige, are you seeing anything different, anything that your clients would be interested in paying a little extra for on the green side? I think if it's a green buyer, they will pay for that house, but it's going to be more of a custom product. That is not going to be your standard, here's what the builder's offering, and oh, look, they have these green features. I think to everyone's point, the buyer loves the green features, but it's not something they're actively looking at, and typically they don't want to pay for an additional cost. If it's there and it's and it's and it's affordable they they're happy to have it um you know sometimes it makes the house more energy efficient so they like that they might give a little bit more for something that leans that way but i think if somebody's really building green those builders that service those people it's going to be more of a custom product and then those people really want the green the geothermal all the energy savings you know that they, they want all that and they'll pay for that but the mass market i don't think is having that same um, desire to have that level of green in their home and pay for it. Great, thank you. All right, so uh, Matt or Misty, I know you guys have been monitoring the Q&A. Uh, do either of you have uh, questions that have hit the Q&A that we have not yet touched that our three remaining panelists uh, uh, would be able and willing to answer? Uh, yes, we've got a couple. Um, here's one. It says, do you think there will be a flood of foreclosures in four to six months with the high unemployment numbers? I'll answer first. Rogers. No, I don't. And I, I think that the thing that we have not really gotten into the details with is we've had 20 some odd million people file unemployment. We have not seen the study as to what they were actually employed doing prior. And I think we're going to see a flood of people making modifications because they thought they could go, you don't go to the casino to win your money back, right? People that lost their, lost a lot of money in the stock market probably are thinking they can go and win it back by getting aggressive. I think we're going to see a flood of people adjusting, but I think we would have already seen this, right? And the, the hot top, the hot words that we've all learned recently, or at least me, forbearance and all these other things. I don't know a single person that's even exercised the ability to do for, to, to forbear, if that's even the proper word. So um, I, I think if anything, we're going to see some people that did exercise forbearance. And if y'all have studied it like I have, you know that it's going to balloon at some point and it might be at the end of three months or six months. That's going to probably lend to a lot of, lead to a lot of listings, but I don't think we're going to see a foreclosure flood like we did 10, 12 years ago. Kyle, how about you? 
Kyle? You're muted, bud. You might be muted. Muted. There we go. Sorry. There you um, I keep a big eye on the bottom lines of everything, and uh, I don't think uh, we're going to see a huge change like we did in 2009, 2010 with foreclosures. Um, the market seems to be holding steady, even though it's a little bit slower. Again, I'll give you my 75230 numbers. Uh, when you look at the panic period of March through May 31st, over a million dollars in 75230, according to MLS, 28, trans 28 closings in that period of time. Uh, last year, same period of time, there were 35 closings. So the market's down a quarter on the closings. When you look at the average sale price, last year the average sale price was 173. This year the average sale price is 169. So it's right there. You know, the, the, the market's holding value, it's just a little bit slower. And I think it's gonna be like the Kentucky Derby right now. The horses are loading into the starting gate. Then you're gonna hear the bell everything's shoot off and instead of it being a selling season that started April 15th that's going to be a selling season that started June 15th. Paige your thoughts on foreclosures do you agree or you have a different perspective? I don't think Paige. we'll see uh, I don't think we'll go into a big foreclosure market I kind of agree with Rogers and Kyle there's a lot of um, pent-up buyer demand um, these people are slowly going back to work as the economy opens back up. We're still, unfortunately, with a high level of people with unemployment. But I think what how that may immediately be impacted is those people may not be buying a house today. But those people are not necessarily going into foreclosure. So I think, I don't think we have in the past. Okay. One other Misty, you said... Real quick, I just want to say, I do think that there's an issue. I have some clients that uh, hold a lot of investment properties that they use as Airbnbs, and they have asked me to start selling those properties off. I think they're having a difficult time related to a COVID change where people are uh, excited about renting a one-off property. So that might be a different market at a different level. Okay, Misty, you said we had uh, one other question that you wanted to uh, get out there. Uh, yes, it says, uh, I've heard that conventional loan limit for our area is going up. What are your thoughts? Conventional loan limit changes. Any of our realtor panels, uh, panelists familiar with that? Like, are, do we are, are about the speculation of it or have the, have the modifications been made? I don't think that I, I don't know that they've been made not no. in the last couple. Months. I've, I've got a really hard time thinking that's going to happen. And I, I think when they modified it, I don't even know what the number is now, but I know it's still in the 400s. You know, that that did a little bit of a stir up. But we all know this, that our economy's fuel is the real estate market. And most first time home buyers, if they're borrowing money, are going to do a conventionally financed loan. And so why would we, you know, prevent them from being able to do so? And no matter who's in office, we're always going to know that, you know, we're going to be able to stimulate the economy with, with, with home buyers. So I don't see those rates a changing. We did see, you know, and, and again, a month and a half ago, there were some banks that literally just stopped taking applications for loans. And that was mostly on the jumbo and the super jumbo um, product. So I, I don't think we're going to see any modifications to that anytime soon. Kyle or Paige, anything else on that? I haven't really put an eye to it. I'm too busy trying to keep clients happy and figuring out how I'm going to help them buy or sell. Yeah. Well, great. Well, um, I, wanted, I haven't heard uh, much, much. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Paige. Nothing. Okay. All right. Well, uh, on behalf of the Builders Association, I want to thank the panelists. Uh, Paige and Rogers and Kyle and Alex. Um, they have done a great job today answering these questions and giving us a flavor of the market and hopefully 
everybody on the on the uh, Zoom call has enjoyed that and gotten something out of it. Uh, Misty, I'm not sure, uh, or Matt, if uh, if there's additional business uh, left on the call. I know there was a question earlier about this, whether this is being recorded, and I I do know that that is being recorded. Um, are there any other? Uh, and I, maybe maybe Misty, you could answer. Uh, how they access that. Is that going to be on the Builder Association website or uh, any other final items from the Builder Association? Uh, yes, we will have the recording on our YouTube channel. Um, should be up tomorrow afternoon and we'll also have links to it on our social media platforms. Wonderful. Anything else on uh, before we adjourn the call? Misty? Nope, we're set to not. go. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, uh, thanks you guys. all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.